Hello, I'm Jim Radford. Thanks for joining me today. Like some of you, I've had several important events and experiences occur over the years. Childhood friends, school events, jobs, family, and travels. And I'd include photography in that list that started at a young age and continues today. When I retired from corporate life, I asked the proverbial question, what do I want to do in retirement and what do I really enjoy? The answer always comes back that I enjoy the challenges with people and the rewards of business, but I also enjoy my passion for photography. So I decided to combine both into a small business, and today I'd like to talk about my approach to photography. First, like many of you, grandkids are a popular photo subject. In my case, it's often surrounding sports, especially hockey. But each child has amazing skills and experiences in their own way that we try to preserve in pictures as they grow. Perhaps that's not much different from your family or even our ancestors. In my family files, someone made this picture back in 1875. It's the first recorded picture I have of the family, mostly from England and living now in southern Illinois. That little guy in the front row was another James Radford, my grandfather, almost 30 years before my dad was born. Photography was invented only 50 years before that, when the Frenchman Joseph Nietzsche created the very first permanent picture in 1826. He used a chemically treated sheet of pewter rather than pencil sketches that had been etched on paper in the back of a bulky camera obscura shown on the right. There was rapid progress in photography in the 1800s that got a foothold in the Civil War years, mostly formal portraits and documentary scenes made by photographers like Matthew Brady. We have relatives that fought in that war. Here's a photo of Jake Miller left on the battlefield for dead at Chickamauga with a musket ball in the forehead, but lived to defy medical logic. William Henry Jackson documented new railroad routes to the west, including the Teton Mountains and Yellowstone, which introduced people on the East Coast to our Western culture and led to the first national park in 1872, and that was Yellowstone. As for equipment in those days, the professionals had the big cameras, but it was the smaller cameras that made photography so popular with amateurs. My dad gave me my first camera in 1955 when I was seven. It cost him seven dollars plus flash bulbs, film and processing. Absolutely indestructible and that was my very first picture of my parents with that camera. So I studied the early photo artists. Do you happen to know who made this picture? Well if you said Ansel Adams it would be a good guess but Actually, it was me trying to emulate the master in Yosemite, complete with the full moon. And here's his original on the left. Of course, I can't approach his skill or knowledge, but I learned some useful lessons, and I felt some of the same awe and inspiration that he did at the foot of this iconic half-dome mountain in Yosemite. Adams created powerful wilderness compositions just as carefully as he did his early works of music. He nearly chose that as a profession. Scholar and curator John Starkowski said, the thing that Adams most wanted to do as an artist was to photograph his mountains as a holy place. His reverence for these places illuminates every image. Adams made the image on the right of Cathedral Rocks in Yosemite in 1949 with the idyllic pond in the meadow, almost a century after Carlton Watkins made the first black and white image in 1861, where many climbers still practice on the vertical walls. I was amazed by this place, almost hidden off the roadway. So I tried it myself, but in full color. It was indeed beautiful and reminded me of the 23rd Psalm. It became my first picture to go viral on the internet with hundreds of thousands of viewers and even today people view and comment about it, including on their own websites. 
I made this photograph in Strasbourg, France. I could have selected any camera, Canon, Pentax, Sony, Nikon, so the one I chose was actually a cell phone. Somebody once said your best camera is the one you have with you. I also hear a lot of people say you must have a great camera. The fact is today the technology is so good, most any camera will do. The expensive ones just have more durability, convenience, and great marketing. We've come a long way in photography. Our cameras are much smaller and do so much more. This is the main reason why there are two billion pictures uploaded to the internet every single day. Back in the war years, there were these photo booths. I guess they were the first selfies long before we had cell phones. In the early 1900s, they became really popular for families and friends to share low-cost pictures of their soldiers at war, of wedding engagements, and of friends. I tried to learn from others in photography. Sometimes they weren't even photographers. I was a sports fan and knew some professional ball players. The coach and player of the New York Yankees was Yogi Berra, who said some things that are arguably profound. The game isn't over till it's over, he said. And my favorite, you can observe a lot just by watching. So I try to watch a scene before I make any pictures. I met a photo instructor in Yosemite named James McGrew, who put the whole discipline of seeing into practical use. He suggested before I shoot a picture to read the landscape, see the light, the textures and shapes, and only then sketch it with pencil or chalk. I saw elements within my photos that I wouldn't otherwise have noticed. I had found a new way of seeing. Ansel Adams called this pre-visualizing. Another teacher, Dr. Matt Matthews from Memphis, told me about a link to photography from a spiritual perspective. I hadn't thought of that. It's probably inevitable whenever we look up at the stars and wonder about a higher power. He said the connection between faith and photography can be stated in terms of a camera simply being a tool to help us retrain the way we see and experience the world over time. This was my first view of the Milky Way, composed of a hundred billion stars, planets, comets, a black hole, and various other space matter. That's a big universe, just too huge for me to fathom. I need faith for that, and the diagonal line, I do recognize that. It's the International Space Station during the time-lapse picture. People are in there. To acquire pictures like that, take some special planning. To locate a very dark place to avoid the bright lights of cities that wash out celestial details. So I have a cell phone app that maps the darkest places where there is no light pollution, no city light. And there are other apps that tell me where the stars are going to be each night, the planets, where the moon and the sun rise and fall. Sometimes I've used the moon to help frame or enhance an iconic scene. You might recognize this as the Opera House in Sydney, Australia. My plan was to show a connection of monotone color and the curving shape of the architecture with the circular moon. Just my way of seeing and arranging shapes and light. Another place to view the stars is at the top of Haleakala Crater in Maui, where the air is rare, the sky is clear, and the clouds roll in below the summit. But at night, it's an even more spectacular scene. It's then when a time lapse of the stars provides another reminder of just how limitless the creation is beyond our understanding. And by day, by simply turning around 180 degrees, I could see the crater of Haleakala Volcano, a former cauldron of rock lava created from an eruption only 230 years ago. The ancient Celts had a belief that places like this might be like a thin curtain between this world and the next, so they called it a thin place. Now let's turn to wildlife and its natural habitat. Birds are among my favorite subjects. I was leading a photo workshop and saw this little tree squallow in a park. 
Seeing the light, I tried to combine the setting sun with the silhouette of the little bird that was bringing insects to its chicks by using a long telephoto lens. So here is the same bird without the sun silhouette. Two different views, but the same bird. I recall a famous Life magazine photographer, Alfred Eisenstedt, who I met in Chicago and told me, take pictures 360 degrees around a subject. One of them will be good. Seemed logical, but back then film wasn't cheap. Now it makes more sense. A hummingbird is a real challenge in motion. It's all about timing and speed. So we study their habits, and as Yogi said, we can observe a lot just by watching. Can we stop the wings, or should we make them blurry? Do we need a flash and telephoto lens? What's the background? So it takes some planning. Bigger birds might take a different approach. Some birds are tolerant of humans, others not so much. Some have very big eyes or beautiful feathers. The sandhill crane on the left held that pose for just a second, as did the egret in a tree silhouetted in front of the solar eclipse. For a single instant exposure, I spent days getting ready and planning for that shot. In Monticello, Minnesota, on the Mississippi River, there's a large flock of about 1,500 trumpeter swans that don't migrate south, but enjoy the warm waters near a nuclear power plant on the river. They're fed a ton of corn a day by a resident neighbor. It's especially photogenic when there's a fog on the river. An eagle is always a popular subject. This one on the Mississippi River too, hunting for fish near Red Wing. It's always good to show the eyes of wildlife. And this eagle became part of a classic shot I made for a magazine celebrating the 4th of July. The symbol of the eagle with our flag is like no other in nature. I found so many interesting creatures on land and in the sea, challenging the photographer sometimes in extreme ways for timing, for distance, for safety, and for access to their secret habitats. Whales are among the most difficult. Never know when they'll appear or disappear in a split second. Sometimes just a tail and a splash of water. In the waters of New Zealand, there are seals that pose for photographers, displaying a considerable amount of behavior on some days. And back in Alaska, the bears would be the most dangerous to photograph. This was a journey through Alaska on the Annan River between Wrangell and Ketchikan on the Inside Passage. It's a photographic pursuit that really requires some pre-planning, hiking through the woods, plus long lenses and ultra-safe tracking practices, preferably with a guide. So here was my guide, John, in the midst of the forest. I turned around to photograph him and was shocked to see a juvenile grizzly tracking us across the bridge and another one behind still on the bridge. I made the picture and yelled bear. The good news was the bears were just curious and already full of river salmon and John talked both back over the bridge no worries but it definitely got my heart pumping. I think timing is everything with wildlife Sometimes I shoot a lot of pictures in burst mode, very fast, just like at hockey games. I watch these bighorn sheep for an hour as they put on a show of combat on the sheer vertical edge of a cliff in the badlands of South Dakota. I try to keep a few things in mind that relate to conservation outdoors with animals. First, we keep our distance and don't stress or surprise the animals. We don't feed or bait the animals. We don't want them to depend on humans. And I expect it may take a while to get a good shot, sometimes coming back a second or third time, sometimes just sitting for hours. Sometimes in the middle of winter, we just don't see many animals. That's when I might visit our local zoos 
At Como Park Zoo in St. Paul, there are plenty of cute primates, big cats, hoofed animals, birds, and mammals. Founded in 1897, Como is a place we've visited many times with our kids and our grandkids. And of course, there is wildlife at the zoo I could never afford to see in the wild. If I'm on a lean budget or short on time, sometimes the best option is to visit the zoo, where captive animals are safely cared for with a professional staff and are easier to photograph. Now let's turn to what's called fine art scenic photography. Close to my home in Shoreview, Minnesota, there are eight lakes and trails. This is at Island Lake, next to Highway 694, a night picture looking east, and it now hangs in the entrance of our new Ramsey County Library. Notice the yellow lights on the shore across the lake. Those lights are here, on the opposite side of the lake, now looking west at the sunset. There's plenty of wildlife here in the park, and each year a community fair called the Slice of Shore View offers the community live music, foods, rides, and a great fireworks display right on the lake. For more iconic scenic photos, I look to the west, where this location reminds me of the Holy Land. Of course, it's the Badlands of South Dakota, created 30 to 60 million years before biblical times. It's an example of the ancient seas in the Midwest that dried up into a warm subtropics. Then the Black Hills pushed up from a fault line to the west with picturesque consequences for future generations. For truly grand mountain scenery, we head further west to the Grand Teton mountain range in Wyoming. Recently, I noticed a similar picture hanging in my dentist's office. I wondered if I could make that same picture, and how about capturing it in the darkness of night? Could I light it up with the moon? So I checked the position and the date of the moon there at Jenny Lake. I checked the weather, the geography. So I made this picture about two in the morning, but not before unseen problems. The clouds started to cover the moon, and I discovered I had the wrong lens. So I walked back to the car, found the lens, and then slammed the door shut, squarely on my thumb. I honestly thought it was broken, blood all over. The moon was dropping fast and my angst was rising just as quick. I made a few pictures and one was good. Ansel Adams once said, a good photograph is not an accident, it's a concept. This was my concept, but I would add, sometimes a concept with options, sometimes with luck. Even further to the southwest, we have the sandstone and red rocks of Arizona. I enjoy Sedona. Perhaps you've been there too. It's evolved into a somewhat commercial site for those who seek out the vortexes, the mystical belief of a natural energy field. The scenery has attracted Hollywood movie makers, healers and psychics, gift shops, and home developers. I try to visit the area when others don't, especially when there are dramatic storms, when the clouds are lifting, the mist is lodged into a canyon, and the light bends around the sandstone from a low angle. Remember, it's all about the light. In fact, photography comes from the Greek root words, drawing with light. It could also mean capturing the beauty of life. Not far away is Page, Arizona, with deeply cut slot canyons from millenniums of flash floods and erosion of the Navajo sandstone curious geometrical shapes and beams, beams of light that cut into these antelope canyons. And nearby is the Colorado River and Horseshoe Bend. Photographers trek across a mile of sand and bring a wide-angle lens to get in the entire vista, but the prize is worth the walk, especially at sunset. There are no fences. A step down is a long one, a thousand feet. One of my favorite scenes demonstrates the power of natural lines and color. From Zabriskie Point in Death Valley, it's noted for its erosion and where Ansel Adams once made a very similar photo, but in black and white.
traveling around the world has taken us to vast areas of water, here surrounding an island near Tahiti. Water supports the ecosystem and feeds the people. It can be peaceful, it can be angry, it can be green, it can be blue, it can be clean, or sadly, it can be toxic. Any way you cut it or pour it, water is at the center of life on this planet and is the subject of countless photographs. Water is managed in Holland, where the windmills of Kinderdijk have harnessed the flow of encroaching water and prevented flooding from the sea since the 1700s. Water at Lake Bracciano, near the small Italian village of Aguilera Sabazia, is basically a volcanic caldera that sunk into the crater 40,000 years ago after years of volcanic activity. I was composing this picture from the pier when a man asked what I was doing. I soon learned he was a famous photographer of rock stars like Sting, Ray Charles, Madonna, and James Brown. In the Pacific, there's more water. We always enjoy the scenery surrounding the ocean waters and the sunsets of Hawaii. Getting closer to the heliotrope trees, we see them growing out of the lava rocks with curious, gnarly branches framing the sailboat and the sea. Seeing the composition as an attractive silhouette is a challenge of timing and composition. And that same tree, just a few minutes later, is often a good time to wait and watch for the end of the light. Sometimes I attach poetry or a Bible verse to these pictures. In this case, a Bible verse I chose was, I am the light of the world, follow me, and you won't be walking in the dark. You'll have the light that gives life. I look for late and early light and the rich colors it produces. Maybe photography is all about the art of seeing, not so much clicking a camera. That has changed my entire approach to making pictures. Here I've tried to capture the power of simple triangles that demonstrate strength, the reflections, and the complementary colors. But again, I wondered how this might look in almost total darkness. So I made this shot in the same location when the stars were out on a clear night. So yes, it's often good to come back a second or third time as conditions change, as we study the scenery and the light and the color. We can observe a lot just by watching. This is plate ice on the north shore of Lake Superior near the Split Rock Lighthouse. I crawled out on the ice and the closer I got to the standing plates of ice, the more interesting it became. Do you see the picture here? The real picture? Focus your eyes closer to just one plate of ice. This is what I saw on the left, which became my keeper, with a brief glimmer of sun amidst all that ice on the beach. Sadly, I came back the next day and the waves had washed it all away. So lesson learned, shoot it now, because coming back tomorrow for a second try just might be too late. In the botanical world, natural colors give us so much more to consider, especially with plant life, which is abundant in Tahiti and Hawaii, as well as right here in Minnesota, despite the snow at the surrounding lakes, the creeks, the forests, and public places like the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum and the Como Conservatory. There is often an interesting complementary effect of colors. Mingled together in the natural world, they could come right out of a book about art design where we learn what colors work well together. But nature already knows that. And of course, that's obvious with the fall colors here. Or in the summertime with the complementary colors of sunflowers and the nearby stand of trees in this field near Grantsburg. Of course, color seems to be part of life wherever we turn. I have a passion for shooting doorways and all the color that surrounds it in European restaurants and homes. And these colorful buildings were captured in Burano, near Venice in Italy. 
And similarly, I photographed these pastel buildings in Curaçao in the Caribbean. Some photographers enjoy turning common color or even black and white scenes into more abstract art just to explore the sense of shapes and lines. Sometimes it turns out well, sometimes not so much. It's always been an enjoyable pursuit for me to experiment with the abstract. It's another way of seeing. Sometimes we discover unique textures as well as color and shapes in nature, both smooth and rough. Things we might take for granted, small things, until we focus our eye move in close for macro photography and see in a new light. Even the simplest leaf, frozen in ice, gives credence to what Yogi Berra said, we can observe a lot just by watching. Look down, look up, look behind you to see the 360 degree world of Alfred Eisenstedt. So that's my presentation today about the nature of photography. I might summarize it all by saying that our appreciation of the natural world is not just the classical environmental conservation of protection and development, but it's also a creative conservation through art and photography. Its concern is not with nature alone, but with the total relation between man and the world around him. Its object is not just man's welfare, but the dignity of his spirit. And above all, we must maintain the chance for our contact with beauty. Thank you.